I'm going to talk to you about reading and persuading your audience. That's the topic that was given to me, and uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, two disclaimers for you guys before we launch into it. First of all, um, I feel you should know that I think I'm both underqualified and overqualified in different ways to talk to you about this for an hour. Um, I'm underqualified because I'm not, I don't teach communications, I'm not a professor, I'm not a teacher, I'm not in the media, I'm not in media relations. Uh, all your other speakers, you know, kind of do this for a living. I'm a lawyer. Um, but I'm kind of overqualified because I'm a lawyer, and the essence of what we do is persuasion, uh, often through speech uh, or writing. Um, and I... You know, I think probably Christy came to me because she knows I was at the AG's office for a decade, and uh, I kind of cultivated a practice where after just a few short years, I was handling all of the sort of uh, emotionally charged, high profile, in the news kind of cases that tend to just jump right into court with big hearings with lawyers arguing to the judge and then go straight to appeal and have big oral arguments that everybody's watching. And so it was a lot of uh, that form of public speech. The audience I know well is judges. Um, I've done it, you know, a lot, but that's not really the audience you guys are speaking to maybe ever or very often at least. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, courtroom judges more so than county judges, although I know you all sit on quorum court, and that's a real court, or so I would argue in a brief. Um, so take, you know, take, take my, my advice with a grain of salt and understand that uh, uh, I don't have a lot of experience speaking to just an, you know, a citizen group or quorum court, although I think I'm going to get more of it moving forward. The second disclaimer is, I'm a ham, guys. I, have, I, I, I love getting up and talking in front of a group or a judge or whatever. And that's my style. Um, my style works for me, but it may not work for you. Uh, Kirsten did a great job of explaining that you got a bob and weave, you got to tailor to your audience. I think you need to tailor to yourself, too. You know, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Emphasize your strengths. Um, move away from your weaknesses. And let's be honest. Public speaking, um, a lot of it is you're kind of either good at it or you're not. But you can make yourself good, okay, even if you're not naturally good. And it takes practice and experience. And um, I've seen, I mean, I'll, I'll just say it, I don't work for her anymore. The best example I know personally is your current Attorney General, Leslie Rutledge. Um, I worked for her until June, for, since she's been AG through June of this year. Um, and we get along great, I like her. Uh, but when she was you know, campaigning originally and, and, and brand new to the role, she wasn't very good at public speaking. She, she really wasn't. Um, not, not just a sort of natural at it. Today, she is really, really good at it. Okay? And she just, she just worked it. She just learned it, practiced it, did it every day, kept doing it kept doing it, and like she's one of the best public speakers around now. Um, so there is hope, even if you think, uh, this is, I don't like this, I get nervous, I, I hate standing up in front of people, you know, stage fright kind of thing. You, if you just get out there and do it, it's not as bad as you think. And then, again and again, and I went through this with oral arguments. I was so nervous, I thought I was going to throw up at the podium my first oral argument, Arkansas Supreme Court. Um, and then, you know, ten arguments later, whatever, I, I, I hardly even get nervous anymore. <clears throat> um, and that just, that just comes from doing it. You realize, oh, that's a really big deal. You know, it's not, it's not what you think in your mind. So, keep that in mind, too. Um, here's my clicker. So, here's a... Uh, oh, and what I've done... <clears throat> I, did a little, I did a little studying on, you know, reading and persuading your audience. But mostly what I did was just kind of brainstorm around, you know, just whenever I happen to think about it and keep a list of ideas that just popped into my head because this is something in the background I'm thinking about for, you know, a month leading up to this. And I boiled it down to 10 tips, fairly simple tips. I know y'all aren't going to walk away with a boatload of information in your brains. Nobody ever does that from, from any sort of presentation. So I'll try to make it relatively simple and give you 10 basic tips that I'll talk to you about. And with each one, 
I've also tried to provide you a, an illustration to you know put it in into context and I've pulled all of my illustrative slides that follow each of the 1 through 10 slides from my own personal Facebook posts. Um, part of that is because I'm a ham. Uh, part of it is because social media is public speech. Um, and so, you know, that, that's not the kind we're really studying and learning about today. Um, but also, uh, part of it is, I've, you know, given my, I've, I've posted on social media about like oral arguments and courtroom experiences and things. And I've got, I've got some pretty good examples of following the advice I'm giving you, me doing good, and I've got some examples where I didn't do so good, you know? And um, it helps to see either way. And you'll, you know, you might learn a thing or two from it. So there's your, you know, what you, what you thought you were coming to see. Is, that's just from our website, and it's got all of my accolades and everything, you know, in the bio. And here's, here's really me. That's, that's me and my son, Hank. And this is really me. That's my daughter, Susie. Uh, Hank makes a couple appearances in the Facebook uh, post that we'll see. Um, but, you know, be yourself at the end of the day. I, I, I don't hesitate to tell a joke even to the Arkansas Supreme Court or the Eighth Circuit if the opportunity presents. <laughs> now, again, that's my style. Be careful. But I haven't been disbarred or anything like that. I've been chewed out by one particular justice, but she was going to do that to me anyway. Um, I, I don't think I've gotten in trouble for my style, um, but I definitely behave differently in front of certain, you know, different judges. And that's about knowing your audience, right? There are a few judges out there who even I won't tell a joke in front of. They, they do exist. I don't enjoy being in their courtrooms very much, but, um, and they don't usually like hearing from me either. So, my first tip is know your audience, and this is, this is, what I'm talking about here is, Anything you can learn about them before you get there, before you take the mic, before you start doing whatever you're setting out to do, give whatever speech you're giving. Um, in my experience, this means I better know the names of all the justices or judges on my panel. I better know as much as I can about each of them individually. I, I try to predict where they're at, all of them, so I can anticipate questions. Who am I going to have trouble from? Who's going to be who's going to be agreeable? Who's going to be quiet? Who's going to be asking all the questions? That sort of thing. Now, that's not necessarily applicable to you, but depending on what sort of group you're speaking to, you may be able to figure out some things about them. If it's a civic group, you know, go look at their website. Figure out what they're all about. Do some background info on them. Um, and do, do more to the extent, you know, to whatever level of the importance of the speech you're about to get. You know, you can't, I know you can't spend all of your time, you know, some lawyers will spend weeks getting ready for an oral argument. I don't, nobody does that for any sort of ordinary speech. I understand that, and I don't even do it for oral argument, but don't tell, don't tell Leslie or Dustin. Um, but, you know, some preparation is really good about your audience. It will help you figure out what to say, what not to say. Um, if it's a small enough group and you know exactly who's going to be there, figure out their names. Find pictures of them. Go to Google Images, see their name and picture, put it together, so when you see them, you can call them by name. They love that! Um, Figure out what they're all about, what their concerns, and tailor your message in advance to whatever you can figure out about it, you know? Do a little background. What's my example about knowing your audience? Oh, it's from AAC. I was sitting in this room. Um, and it was the day that we had the sheriffs, and they were, they were having a training. And, I, and I, went on, I went on Facebook later that day, and I said, I'm observing some training for about 60 county sheriff officials from all over Arkansas, and I'm the only one wearing a cowboy hat. Most of them have guns, but all I've got is my pew, 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 finger gun. <laughs> I didn't really know my audience before I went in there that day. Fortunately, I wasn't talking. I was just in the audience, you know? Uh, and I know, I know them now. I still wear my cowboy hat. But, um, all right. This is more about reading. This is on, more on the reading your audience side. Talk to the listeners. L look at the people who are looking at you. Talk to them, you know? If somebody's on their phone or whatever, ignore them. They're ignoring you. They don't, who cares, you know? Uh, I don't know of hardly any audience, including, you know, Supreme Courts and, and, and high-level courts and stuff where everybody's paying attention to every word. It just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's okay, you know? Those who are listening are the ones who matter. <clears throat> and look at them, talk to them, try to figure out if they're, if they're 
if they're feeling it and you're getting a lot of head nods, that's good. If they're looking confused, read that. And, and if they're paying attention and they're looking confused, you might have a problem. If they're looking angry because they see something on their phone, ignore that. Um, it's hard, you know, it's, it can be hard to ignore. People can be distracting. They might have their phone on, making noise or whatever. Just, just put it out of your mind as much as you can. Don't let it, don't let it irritate you. Um, I only care about the people who are listening. They're the ones who are ready to receive whatever message I'm trying to deliver. Um, so... On this one, I'm not going to read it all out to you, but uh, this one's about Hank, and this is from a couple years ago when he was four, and I talk about how he's a great role model in my life, but I have to filter certain things, such as his present-day communication skills at age four. Uh, without that, something like this may happen, and I spelled out what looks like a courtroom transcript, and this is what would happen if I adopted Hank's four-year-old speech style in court. It would be a lot of, Your Honor, Your Honor, Your Honor. Your Honor, Your Honor, Your Honor, Your Honor, you know, and then, and so on until finally the judge says, take your seat, Mr. Jorgensen. <laughs> Let's see. Preparation. I already talked a little bit about this. Kirsten talked a little bit about this. Can't say it enough. Again, depending on the importance of the speech and how much time you can devote to it. Practice, practice, practice. Kirsten said, get a, you know, record yourself, get a video. That's great advice. I, I, I just use a mirror. You know, I just, uh, I, if it's important enough and I'm actually preparing, I will, um, you know, stand in front of a mirror and do whatever it is I'm getting ready to do. And, you know, I try to get to a point where I'm looking at the mirror and not at my notes or whatever uh, because I want to be looking at the audience and not at my notes. And uh, it doesn't make much sense to stand in front of a mirror and practice something when you're not looking at the mirror. So that helps, it helps me get away from my crutch, which is whatever cheat sheet I've prepared for whatever I'm doing. And it helps me see how I'm, how I'm looking to my audience. Now I'll be honest, I've only done this for, for some oral arguments and not even all oral arguments. I don't do it for a, something like today. Uh, but if it's, if it's important enough, it's a really good tool. Um, cite credible sources. Kirsten mentioned that. That's a big thing. Throw some, throw some data in your message that is according to someone else. And then, but they agree with you. And they're some sort of expert on whatever it is. It boosts your own credibility. Um, and it boosts the persuasion of whatever message you're trying to deliver. Now, avoid vocalized pauses. I, not everybody may know what that means. Vocalized pauses are are things like, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, it's that sort of thing. This is, you know, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> First of all, it's hard. It's hard to get away from vocalized pauses because of the way we talk. Um, but you can, in a, in a formal speech setting, you can get train yourself to where what it, it happens when you lose your train of thought. Okay, you lose your spot, you lose whatever, you forget what your next point was, and you need a few seconds of time. And so you fill them with vocalized pauses. Just be silent for that until you catch your train of thought. It takes work, it takes practice, it, you can get there though. And believe me, the audience, even judges, it doesn't matter who the audience is, they don't notice. A few seconds to them is nothing. It feels like an eternity to you when you're standing up here and you're, you're not talking. But they may even think it's intentional. If it's wedged nicely between one point and another, they may think it's for emphasis, to let you absorb the importance of what I just said. Right? And you may do that on purpose for emphasis like that, but it may be a complete accident. And if you, you tip your hand when you throw out a bunch of ums and uhs that you're lost, you know, you've... You're stumbling a little bit, and it's okay. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. The best lawyers in the country do it at the U.S. Supreme Court in oral argument all the time. But people who do it less are better speakers. Um, uh, <laughs> just be quiet until you know where you're ready to go next, and then start there. What have I got for preparation? Ah, this is a good one. This is from um, last year. 
And I say, I've got an oral argument in less than a week. The final stage of my preparation is involuntary, around-the-clock oral argument with myself. As always, I cannot thank my wife enough for her unwavering patience and understanding. Um, she, she thinks I'm pretty crazy when I'm heading into a big one because I really do. I, I talk to myself constantly leading up to it. I talked to myself a little bit, you know, this morning and maybe yesterday leading into this. It just, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about something I'm going to say. And I just say it. And I don't really care if people think I'm crazy. It's a form of preparation. It really is. For me, it is. I mean, if it works for you, use it. If not, that's okay. But don't feel like there's something wrong with sort of just playing with the ideas in your mind. You can, you can develop a lot of structure to your argument that way. You can come up with new ideas. It's okay to just think about stuff, and it's even okay to talk to yourself. Talk out loud. <laughs> Or I hope so, anyway, because I do it all the time. <laughs> okay, there's three Latin words that you see a lot when you, when you study persuasive speeches. So I saw them enough that I thought I'd better tell, them, tell you about them. It's ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos is essentially know, <coughs> know yourself. Know your message, but really know yourself. Um, it's important if you're going to get up and talk in front of a group. It, like I said at the beginning, know your strengths and weaknesses. And if you understand that stuff, you will be better able to convince them that you know what you're talking about. Because you're not going to tell them about things you don't know. Because you know yourself. The things you do talk about, you will know. And you'll be convincing. If you're getting something that's super persuasive, know both sides of the argument before you get up and start talking to people. That will help you anticipate the kind of questions you're going to get the kind of attacks you might get if it's, if it's hostile. Um, and you will be able to respond if you understand both sides of the argument. And you can gain more credibility by understanding and maybe even elaborating on and stating better the other side of the argument because you knew it coming into this. Oh yeah, that's the other side of the argument that goes like this. And just, you just lay it out there and acknowledge it. It's right there for everybody to see then shoot it down with your better side of the argument that's your message. That's so, you get so much more credibility if you're able to completely acknowledge the full argument as accurately as possible of the other side and then tear it apart. That's much better than just trying to tear it apart and hide from it. Oh, oh here we go. So what do we got for Know Yourself? Ah, I was swimming the other day at the pool, and Wesley Clark was there swimming. Remember, he ran for president, general. Um, he's twice my age, and apparently he swims twice as fast as I do, despite that. Uh, so I talked about that, and I said, he's wearing a Florida swimming shirt, and I'm wearing a Michigan Law shirt at the pool. Maybe I could swim circles around him at oral argument. But apparently, no matter how old he gets, I'm never going to swim as fast as he does. Know yourself. Logos. This is logic. The essence of logic is true premise plus true premise plus however many more true premise you want equals true conclusion. That needs to be the structure of any argument, and no matter what you're, whether you're a lawyer or, or anything else. Uh, if you've got a false premise in there, that's not sound logic. So watch out for false premises. I put three-point argument breakdown in there. Kirsten kind of talked about that a little bit. When preparing your, your argument, it's, um, it's often taught, I was taught in high school debate, it's, it was taught in college, I think it's, it was taught in the equivalent class I took in college that Kirsten teaches. If, if it makes sense to boil your argument down to three points, and even while you're speaking, you know, you do your introduction like she talked about, and when you move into point one, you might step over here and say, first, and then talk about that. And then you move over here and you say, second, or next, or whatever. And you talk about that point, and then you kind of back up and say, third point. And you talk about that, and then you step back where you started, and you conclude, and you bring it home. And boom, you win, whatever it was. Because people follow that. So for some reason, that, and including the body movement with it, it's just there's some magic there. I don't really understand why. But it's taught enough that there must be some truth to it. And with logos, you want to appeal to people's sense of reason. 
So you're giving them facts. And pretty much any argument has to include some facts and needs to appeal to people's reason. This is almost universally applicable. If it's persuasive, which is all I'm talking about, by the way. Um, appeal to their, their sense of reason. Convince them that they have independently reached the same conclusion that you, that you are trying to get them to reach. And then they don't care about you anymore. It becomes their opinion. That's way stronger than you telling them it's, it's, that it should be their opinion. So here's, I've got three different logics from Facebook. First, we've got sound logic. This is from 2014. My wife and I are watching the NBA Finals. And I started the LeBron James versus Michael Jordan, who's the greatest basketball player ever conversation. I started outlining the merits of both sides of the debate. And my wife quietly says, but can LeBron fly? And like that, poof, debate over. Now that's a false premise, of course. But if it were a true premise, sound logic right there, you know? <laughs> LeBron can't fly, Michael Jordan can. Debate over. <laughs> Here's some questionable logic. Someone saw a snowflake in Arkansas. Accordingly, all schools and daycare south of the Mesa Dixon line are closed until July. <laughs> questionable logic. Uh, Completely out of milk and bread. <laughs> right, right. And here's just piss poor logic, basically. Uh, this is a big long diatribe where I'm talking about how I'm getting to drive my dad's sweet car for a month because I loaned my, my wife's old car, which I drive, to a friend. And I'm talking about all these problems with it. It's an, old, it's an M5 Beamer, I love it. But, uh, you know, it gets terrible gas mileage, everything breaks all the time. It's got all these problems, and, I, and these are all my premises, right? And you can read it, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. But then I conclude, I love this car. <laughs> Not good logic, although true. All right, we're moving pretty fast, but that's okay, I guess. Uh, oh, by the way, I should have said at the beginning, please raise your hand and interject with questions, comments, corrections, anything like that, anytime, okay? We can talk, we can, I can turbo through the rest of this at any moment in like two minutes if necessary. <laughs> it would be, you know, engaged audience is better. I should have led with that. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Pathos, emotional appeal. This is only sometimes important. Sometimes you want to avoid it. Again, know your audience, know your subject matter. If it is something that has inherent emotional appeal, you need to be ready for it. And you want to emphasize the people that you're talking to, their personal connection to this, whatever it is. I think this is going to be relevant a lot for a lot of you. You know, um, local issues matter to people and are personal. And that's, that's emotion. That, that, that brings emotion into it. You may want to intentionally invoke or evoke, really, an emotional response from them. If you can, you know, and you can do this through visuals on PowerPoint or whatever, by telling story, by, you know, whatever, whatever method. Um, if the circumstances are right, you may want to bring people into their emotional appeal in order to bring them into your view of whatever you're trying to persuade them. It may be a key component of it. So be ready for that and think about that in advance. Um, Here we've got an example from a Supreme Court oral argument I had. It was not a particularly important case, but it did have oral argument, Supreme Court. And it was the first one that was ever broadcast live on the internet. I don't know, if some of you may know, the Arkansas Supreme Court, you can watch the oral arguments live on the internet and they're archived starting September 16, 2010. And I was at the podium that day, and so was another lawyer. And I learned some lessons that day that you can, I had a broken leg, and apparently it's okay to come to oral argument on your crutches. But I also learned that you should not hurl a crutch at the justices. Um, if your exaggerated hand gestures, which I'll talk more about in a minute, fail you in this regard, you should quietly hop over on one leg and pick up your crutch and get back to the podium and carry on as if nothing happened. Um, here's some visual for you from that oral argument. You can tell it's about seven years ago because I got a lot more hair. There's my crutches. I've got them resting nicely there, and you see hand gestures, and then you see me reaching in the bottom left corner. Oh no, I just whacked my crutch. And what happened is it flew forward right at Chief Justice Hannah, who you see in the middle bottom. And I hopped over, picked it up, and then I laid it back up, and you can tell I'm embarrassed in the lower right-hand corner. But 
it, it went fine. And I put this under pathos because my, oppo my opposing counsel got up and you know, immediately told a joke about <coughs> not having crutches for emotional appeal or something like that, you know? And it was like, I mean, my leg was really broken. I wasn't making it up. It's not like a plaintiff being wheeled into the courtroom for a, in a personal injury case in a wheelchair and they were out playing golf yesterday. It wasn't like that, but, um, but it had that sort of appearance and he made a joke about it and it was great, you know? Everybody was sort of following the, the, the rules of the game and doing a good job with it except for me hurling my crutch. Chief Justice Hannah. There's another visual, from, these are just still shots from the video. They're not very high quality, I'm sorry. Um, there is an, uh, one that I couldn't find, but I had at one time where you can see him snickering, clearly. And it's right in the middle of all this, so I, I didn't feel too bad about it, because I saw that live. I knew he was okay with it, and he was patient to let me go get it. Thank you, Chief Justice Hannah. <laughs> all right, so tip. Focus. Stay on message. You hear this a lot. It's not always easy. Um, the goal is to not let anything throw you off message. But people are going to try to throw you off message. Especially Supreme Court justices and judges and stuff like that who disagree with you. Or whoever you're talking about who disagrees with you. If they are not hesitant to interject their voice into the conversation, they're going to try to throw you off message. So, you hope that doesn't happen, but be prepared for it. It's, it's probably going to happen. You've probably all experienced it. There's not a magic solution to it. Um, I, I say take questions almost always. Kirsten, I think, kind of agreed with that. But you better be prepared if you're going to take questions, because that's a prime opportunity for somebody to try to derail your entire presentation, whatever it is. Which is fine. Again, please feel free to try to derail me anytime with your hand in the air. That's totally fine. There's, there's not any... I, I think preparation is about the best thing you can do to prepare for staying on message. And then having the goal of staying on message while you're there and keeping that in your mind. Judge Ellison. You like lettuce. I do like lettuce. Thank you. Back to staying on message. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, this... Uh, what my... My Facebook post about this one is uh, one of my best war stories. You see a, a picture of me there in a suit in a bathroom and I've got my eyes cut. What happened was, we were about to have a big hearing in, the, in front of Susan Weber, I, federal judge, in the case about the 12-week abortion law. I was defending the law, the constitutionality, it was the ACLU on the other side, and I, I was there with the chief deputy from the AG's office who was just there for appearances. It was me to argue it. And probably, I mean, it couldn't have been more than five minutes before we're, we're set to go. I bent over to get my, you know, something out of my bag or whatever, and I just smacked my face on the corner of the table, just like this. And I was just like, oh, oh. And I started to ignore it. And I, I turned toward Brad Phelps. He's now chief counsel over ASU. And he was just looking at me with this horrified look on his face. And I felt blood coming down. I was like, uh-oh. I gotta go to the bathroom. So I ran to the bathroom, snapped a picture before I, you know, after I cleaned up. And I ran back into court and it was time. And I just put it behind me and stayed on, you know, and I got up and I gave a good argument. It was the loser. We never, you know, we lost that case all the way to the US Supreme Court because of the Constitution. But um, it didn't affect me one bit. It really didn't. Other than a couple times, Judge Wright was like, are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? Yes. Please, Your Honor, I promise I'm okay. Let's, let's ignore this. You know, the, the tissue that's on my eye. <laughs> just listen to my words, Your Honor. But I was still ready to go. Like, I just, you know, I ran to the bathroom, took care of it, I came back, and it was out of my mind. Uh, and, b by the way, Brad Phelps has since told me, uh, you know, he was, he was the top person in the office below Dustin McDaniel, the Attorney General at the time, right? He, he since told me that he was so terrified because he thought I was going to have to you know, go off in an ambulance or something, and he was going to have to argue the case, which he was not prepared to do. <laughs> and it was like full of media, and every seat was full, and I, I just, I love thinking about his terror sitting in there while I was in the bathroom, you know? Uh, it's really funny. We're friends now, so it's not like I'm, you know, it's not an anti-boss thing. I just, you know, I think it's really funny. 
All right, I'm going to move on unless anybody wants to talk about anything. Eighth tip, humility. I am not qualified to talk to you all about humility, but I at least try, which is more than most people do, and will get you a long way, actually. Especially in the, in the, in the midst of a presentation, if you can demonstrate a little bit of humility, and it can be in the form of, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question, um, or I'm not really the expert on this topic. I mean, you don't want to go too far with it. But true, you know, forthright humility about your, your personal limits or whatever it may be, people think, you know, you get so much credibility for that. It, it is interpreted as integrity because it is. That is what it is, right? And your audience will trust you. And more so than with credible sources, more so than with just about anything. If you can find a way to work in some humility, you're, you're doing a lot, you're going to do a lot better with whatever it is than you would without it. Um, number 10 is going to be levity, by the way. Humor. I think self-deprecating humor is useful given the right audience. It's a form of humility, but it's also kind of a form of ego. It's a weird thing. But still, any effort toward humility, if it fits and it works well, is going gonna, is gonna to enhance your, your persuasiveness. So what have we got for humility? Oh, this, this. You know these online surveys that tell you, you know, predict all of your, your personal qualifications. I will read this one to you. This is from two years ago, so I'm 36, 35 something years old when, when I took this survey. And it said, uh, according to an online survey that purports to predict a person's age based on lifestyle choices, I lead the lifestyle of a 98-year-old. <laughs> the survey did not even uncover my false teeth or my grandpa driving style, nor did the survey discover my daily commitment to fiber powder. Speaking of powder-related discoveries, I investigated the ingredients of my favorite protein powder and discovered that it is substantively indistinguishable from Ensure. <laughs> Hashtag grateful old man. <laughs> Um, you know, that's kind of that blend of humility and ego again. I, I, I can't get, I, I just can't do it any better than that. But, um, humility goes a long way. People thought that was hilarious. I, I did too. That's why I shared it, you know? It's true. I took a survey and that's what it said. If I'd taken it 10 years before, it would have said I was a reckless, crazy 16-year-old, I'm pretty sure. You know, based on responses. All right. Tip number nine, body language. This is tough because you get lost in what you're doing and what you're saying and you don't think about your, your hands going all over the place and, and stuff like that, but it's, it's another thing that you can work on over time and you can improve on. And there's, there are certain things you can do in preparation to assist with it, such as choosing the right outfit to wear based on what you're doing. Um, I'd better wear a suit if I'm talking to a judge. You may not want to wear a suit if you're talking you know, to a, in a much less formal environment. Uh, posture is important, frankly. Pe people, you know, judge you based on, they, they, may not, they may not judge you positively based on good posture, but if you have terrible posture, people will just naturally start to think that you're, you lack confidence, you, you don't, you're not, you don't really believe in your message, that sort of thing, and you, you can lose them, you know? If you're trying to persuade, hand gestures, are hard. Kirsten talked about them. I could talk to you all day about them. Uh, I like having a mic that I can keep my hands locked in on. Um, but when I'm at a podium, like at, in court, where there's a, just a mic affixed to the podium, my hands, my hands are just going, man. I can't stop it. Um, some hand gestures are good, though. And you want to be uh, inclusive to your audience. It's, it's a science, and I don't really fully understand it. Fortunately, most of my natural instincts are on the inclusive side rather than the exclusive side, but, but where your palms are facing toward you, you're trying to bring them in and stuff like that, or if you're pointing to them, you're, you're connecting. What you don't want to do is that kind of thing, right? Um, but you're just doing all this stuff sort of subconsciously while you're talking, while you're doing what you're doing. Uh, Again, the video, if you, if you have an opportunity to be able to go back and watch yourself on video, you, you can see whether your hand gestures are fine or great or you might need some work. Um, 
Here's me in an argument and some hand gesture action. I put this on Facebook and the Solicitor General promptly commented on it. Colin, five are good, one is bad. Which one's bad? And I looked at it and I was like, well, yeah, the bottom right corner is bad because I got my palm up at the justices. You know, that, I'm sure that only lasted a millisecond. But there's all different kind. Of, you know, all these others are okay. I'm, I'm, I'm with them. I'm communicating with them instead of separating myself from them. It's it's complicated. If you're standing at a podium for 20 minutes and it's on video, you're going to see good examples and bad examples of, of everything. You're, the things you say, your body language, the things you do. About the only thing you can fully control is what you what you wear when it comes to body language. But you can practice and get a lot better. Yes. Uh, my daughter was telling me to, that she had learned to go across her arms and that closes her cell phone. That's right. That's right. This, this is a no-no. This is I'm turning inward. Definitely. Um, but some people feel like they have to do that because they, they're like me. They got happy hands. They're just all over the place. If they don't do something with them, they got to ground them somewhere, right? Uh, so. But it's better, it's probably better to have happy hands than to be bottled up. Nobody's listening if you do that. People, even if you don't realize you understand what that means, you do. You get it. And people will tune you out. Pretty soon you're talking to a, a room full of people looking at their phone, or they've all got nothing left. Whatever the case may be. Um, you know, you're, you're there to talk to these people. You're with them. They're, not, they're, they're with you, too. They wouldn't be there if they didn't have some interest, I would hope, on almost all circumstances. Um, but if they're there and they're still ignoring every single thing, just ignore them right back. Yes? Uh, another thing, too, is um, perspiration, body sweat. Mm -hmm. I was shooting a video years ago when the guy that was directing it, because we were making this uh, publication and uh, he's, he's like, and it was hot, it was summer, and he goes, we have got to forehead dry because the, the observation of sweat tells people that you're lying, that you're not telling the truth. And so if you want to Right. Sure that you now, that, that, is, that is kind of true, although I, there's also people sweat from just being nervous, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. Right. And of course, if you're standing outside in Arkansas in August, everybody's sweating. So people aren't probably going to read too much into it, but that's right. I mean... That's another one. There's a lot of, there, there's, there's a whole, I bet there's college classes on this, you know, sort of the subconscious cues from body language and other visual things about truth telling and credibility and everything else. Um, I just tried to hit the highlights. I mean, we're not going to all roll out of here and be F. Lee Bailey or whoever we think is the best speaker ever. Um, that's not, I don't think that's anybody's goal. We just want to be comfortable with it and competent, right? And get as good at it as we can be. And that's good enough for almost everything. Did I do any more? Okay, levity is my favorite. So I put it at the, back, at the end. I believe that levity is almost always appropriate. That is one thing you can certainly disregard if you disagree with me. Because it's very important that you be good at it if you're going to throw it out in a questionable situation. For the reason Kirsten explained, that you don't want to offend people Bad jokes, you know, no joke is better than a bad joke. But a good joke is better than no joke. I think. I think it's underrated. I think it's underappreciated. I've told jokes at the Arkansas Supreme Court in the middle of an oral argument. Not, not even plan to, but when the opportunity pre presents, I just can't resist it. I, it's the truth. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think, ooh, is this going to help our heart? I just did it. You know, and I just that's, just, that's just what you do when you're up there and there's no time to think about anything. But, um... A natural flow j joke that just happens and you seize that moment, there's nothing better than that, I don't think. But it's also okay to lead with a joke if it's a good one and you plan it, that's good, that's good, for the reasons Kirsten talked to you about already. I say don't miss an opportunity to entertain. Uh, use your best judgment on that based on what you know about yourself and your audience. But for me, I... I'm hard pressed to think of a situation where I wouldn't do it. I mean, jokes are jokes are appropriate in extremely informal settings. Jokes are appropriate at funerals anymore. 
I mean, you want, you know, you, <coughs> laughter is a good thing, right? <coughs> Especially laughter from someone who you know disagrees with you on whatever you're trying to persuade about, and you get them laughing. Uh, they may, they, you may, you may bring them around. You may, or they may write a terrible opinion talking about how awful your argument was, but they still laughed. So my my core example for this one is uh, trial court, Judge Piazza, but not the mar not the same sex marriage case. This goes back a ways before that. This is from the um, Initiated Act One of two thousand eight lawsuit, which was the gay foster and adoption ban. That's what people knew it as, but it was really banning folks who cohabited outside of marriage with sexual partners. So it applied regardless of your sexual orientation. You, you would not be eligible to foster or adopt children in Arkansas if you were living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, basically, outside of marriage, right? We had this huge case about it. The ACLU, they brought in Sullivan and Cromwell from international, their huge international law firm in New York. They brought in their big guns from New York. There were like 15 lawyers at any one time against me and whatever. That, so that was the case. And we were in court with Judge Piazza, I think on summary judgment hearing. It was just argument, no evidence or anything. Lawyers taking turns at the podium. And I'm up there, and we're talking about this one plaintiff child who uh, could not be adopted or fostered by an uncle in Arkansas because he, he was living with a, he was cohabiting outside of marriage. But she had a grandma in Oklahoma who wanted her, and so DHS sent her over there. Problem solved. Well, problem solved according to the state's position in that case. Judge Piazza looks at me, this is a real transcript from this case, by the way. This happened in, in an old courtroom in front of the media and everything. I'm glad it didn't make the media. But again, I'm just going on the fly and saying whatever comes out of my mouth. And he says, you're not suggesting we send everybody to Oklahoma, are you? And once I figured out what his question was, I said, not at all, Your Honor. I went to college in Oklahoma, and I don't suggest anyone go there for an extended period of time if you can help it. I got out as soon as I graduated. He laughed, so it was a good joke. Afterward, one of the lawyers from the other side came up to me and was like, I'm from Oklahoma. I'm a little bit offended. I was like, well, you know, sorry. It's the truth, you know. Uh, I really did get out as quick as I could and have no place to go back. Um, he said he was from Oklahoma. She, yes. Okay. Right. Right, she left too. She knew. That. <laughs> That's what I should have said. You don't live there now. That's the problem. But, yeah. By the way, on the federal court hearing where I got a bloody eye, I, I threw a joke in there about the ACLU's left hook. You know, but I don't have a transcript from that hearing. I'd have showed you that one. It did happen, and it did miss the media again. It's it's good if the joke lands with your audience, but doesn't appear on the front page of the paper. But really, you can't control that, right? Uh, you just risk it and hope for the best. Um, I don't have any more slides for you. I started early. It's we're done way early. But I'd love to keep talking because I'm a ham. I'd love to talk about any questions or issues or disagreements. With anything I've said, I'm not the world, world's authority on this stuff. I just did a little preparation and was willing to jump up and take the mic. Reading your audience, persuading your audience. So I like your topic about humility. And uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm dealing with animal control in Faulkner County. And a couple of years ago, while riding my Harley on a weekend, I ran over a dog and totaled my Harley and spent the night in the hospital. And I've been able to use that experience uh, a lot in dealing with animal control because I've had personal experience with it. And uh, oftentimes, I, I, you know, I have to, when I'm visiting with the animal control people, the animal interest people, and they really get intense, then I can bring that issue up. And oftentimes they laugh about it, that I've actually sacrificed my Harley for your cause. Well, and, is that, and did you get hurt? Uh, Were you okay? No, it was just overnight for an observation. But, okay. Uh, but nothing hurt but my pride. Right, right. I, and, and, you know, uh, a, a wise person I know once told me that you don't have to be humiliated to learn about humility, but it makes a nice shortcut. That's right. You know, and that's the truth in that, too. If you get up and do things and you seize the moment and you give that speech, even though you're afraid and, and so on, over enough time, you're, you're going to have humiliating moments, and it's okay because you're going to realize... It's not really a big deal. 
you know, and you might even be able to use it in moving forward. And you will grow from it, and maybe others too, depending on what it is. So you get better at everything. Who else? What else? On your logos, you touched about being true, true premise, true premise, and how many, however many true premises. You never said anything about the alternative facts. What? Right. Alternative facts. Uh, in, in logic, I've, I majored in philosophy, I took logic classes in college. There, there are no alternative facts in real logic. That's used quite a bit nowadays. It is, but that's unsound logic. I don't know what to tell you. Facts are either true or false in logic. So a true fact can be a premise, a false fact cannot, for a sound argument. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. That's way, you know, mm, you, I would not recommend using alternative facts in your own speeches, but you may be presented with some from the audience. Right. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them alternative facts, but I would fall back on your real data with your credible sources, and hopefully your own credibility that you've cultivated by being a good speaker and convincing them that you're honest and stuff like that, and just turn it back to the, the underpinnings of your argument. If it's, often the alternative facts cannot be true along with the real fact. They are, it's not possible for both to be true, so you just turn back to the true fact. Say, this so is you, what, according actually, to the you know Department of Justice, this is the fact. You can rebut in your uh, opposition to it. Right. <laughs> now, if you're if if you're in a situation where you you know like a debate or something where you've got another speaker who's presenting the other side and they start using alternative facts, you're winning because mm -hmm. you're using real facts and you can get up there and rebuttal and cite your sources. Um, that, that if you're using alternative facts, you probably don't want to cite your sources. 